Today, I wish to share with you a reflection that is written by Dr. Israel Kamad Zandu, Associate Professor of New Testament Studies at St. Paul's School of Theology in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, which happens to be a Methodist, a United Methodist Seminary. He is the author of Abraham Our Father, Paul and Ancestors in Post-Colonial Africa. Hear the words of Dr. Kamad Zandu. The Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans is both a countercultural and counterpolitical document. It points to the global renaissance of a human family whose identity, frame of perception, regard, uh, and discipleship are based on God's act of reconciling with humanity, regardless of our vulnerability. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, is a summary and reminder of the first 11 chapters in Romans in which the Apostle Paul is writing an apologetic of the presence, work, and call of God on the entire human family. Readers are called to live a countercultural lifestyle, moving from the life of flesh to a life formed by the Holy Spirit. Thus, writing to those under the Roman Empire, Paul persuades Christian communities living in the imperial center to live not according to the political ideologies of Rome, but rather to live out faith on the basis of what God did in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. While some scholars think Romans is a doctrinal letter, I think of Romans as a call to abandon the sin of individualism and to embrace the cross-cultural Christian life, the life to which Paul calls Christians in Rome, and consequently those in the 21st century, is a life that exhibits the essence of God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Put differently, a holy life is one through which all one says and does is governed by sacrificial living. To worship the God proclaimed in this letter and throughout Scripture is to adopt a stance of humility and self-denial. In the Scriptures, readers see God's attention to humility through whom God calls. For some, humility is a birthright. For others, humility is a learned disposition. The former is easily discernible among people who live in so-called third world nations. Christians in the Roman Empire were probably accustomed to the culture of affluence. We can see this in the Apostle Paul's appeal in verse 1, where he pleads with Christians to present their bodies as instruments of the Holy One. In third world countries, humility is often a daily posture. Those who struggle to feed their families, send their kids to school, afford clean water, and maintain a farm, see God in their daily vulnerabilities. Alternatively, so-called first world nations seem to take God for granted, easily becoming blind by affluence, political smartness, academic achievement, and the striving for the American dream while failing to appreciate God's provisions of these blessings. Instead of being thankful to God, first world Christians risk worshiping God's blessings instead of worshiping God, the source of true life. 
Hence, the Apostle Paul calls on Christians to metaphorically see the manifestations of God not just in the materialistic world, but in every aspect of their lives. In essence, worship is not just a Sunday adventure, but an everyday sacrificial practice. The way Christians live their lives in today's world should be one, embracing worship both within and without uh, and without side of the church building. In Romans 12 chapter uh, in Romans 12 verse 1, the apostle Paul seems to raise the following question: Where is God in your living? Where is God in your living. In this regard, Paul's appeal and persuasion points Christian practitioners to what can be called testimonial living. <clears throat> when Christians live out of life, uh, live out a life of testimony, they become instruments of evangelism, missionary work, and discipleship. Most of what we encounter and read in the scriptures depicts the lives of faith practitioners transformed by God's grace and compassionate love. Distinct from sermon, testimonies function as vehicles by which others hear and perceive God's work in the lives of people. Let me repeat this once more. Distinct from sermon, testimonies function as vehicles by which others hear and perceive God's work in the life of people. There is no sacrificial living without a testimony. Notably, the Apostle Paul is not just talking about sacrificial living. He himself is a testimony Paul's life in God is a story, one that must be told throughout global Christianity. We also see models of the sacrificial and testimonial life uh, in the lives of the apostles, such as Mary Magdalene, who offered her life as a living sacrifice. She declares, I have seen the Lord. He is risen. Testimonial experiences lead one on a journey from conformity to transformity, to transformation of one's living through the mind, heart, and soul. Paul is a paradigm of such transformation as his life was powerfully and dramatically transformed by his encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. Like Paul's life, our lives will indeed become aligned with the gospel of Jesus Christ if transformed by our encounter with Jesus on our own Damascus roads. Instead of conforming to the ideas of the world, one will take a 180 degree turn toward a life of service and humility in and outside of a Sunday morning worship. With humility comes a loss of pride, arrogance, and ego. These three are cancerous to a church as they give birth to superiority and inferiority complexes. Caught between affluence and Christianity, humanity consciously and unconsciously slides into the dark world of wretchedness, injustice, and dehumanization of others. Instead of obscuring God in those whom one dehumanizes, transformation will illuminate God's presence in all human beings. This metamorphosized life heart, soul, and mind leads to the renewal of consciousness 
and allows one to be an instrument of God. God made humans to be partners in transforming the world. From the beginning, God invites humanity into transformative relationship. Paul was entrusted with the gospel in which human families are called to be transformed in every aspect of their lives, the culture, ethnic, gender, political, economic, social, and geographical boundaries. This transformation comes to us through grace as we are saved through our belief in God and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The power of the gospel to equalize humanity before God becomes the impetus through which we become part of the body of Christ, a term Paul uses to describe the church and its members. Thus, each member's identity and essence becomes intertwined with the other, regardless of color and gender, uh, nationality, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or race. Our faith in God becomes our common denominator, rather than our affluence, education, status, and upbringing. With God as the source, a transformed life oriented to the Holy Spirit is the engine that drives our growth as a fellowship of believers. In the context of Paul's theology and practical life applications, remember that transformation and renewal are not one-time events, but an intentional process endeavored through humility, prayer, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and our total surrender to the Trinity. If the body of Christ loses its divine interdependence, it will lose its source of power. And I want to read this sentence over again. If the body of Christ loses its divine interdependence, it will lose its source of power. Think about that. Without the power and formation of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian, one will not be able to discern God's pro uh, purpose in his or her life. In other words, the grace of God and power of the Holy Spirit are indispensable qualities to assist people in their discernment in what is good acceptable to God, and perfect. The good news of Jesus Christ is a corrective to the 21st century individualism because it advocates for the transformation of the entire human family. Paul employs the image of the church as a human body with several parts working in tandem in its function. We are called to a life that appreciates the diversity of gifts and talents through which the body of Christ can function as God intends. This body functions from a posture of humility when each part is invited to contribute. Used in the service of building the church, each part will be enriched, appreciated, and honored in his or her magnifying of God. Indeed, one's gifts find meaning in the giftedness of others who seek to build the kingdom of God in today's world. Amen. Thank you. Dr. Kamandzanda for your kind words.